modern biology example here, which is about voltage, current, um, current and resistance. And what audio and video does is that you can use the concrete example of what you see and you can talk about the abstraction from that like the rules about it. So you get this voiceover description and analysis which is much more powerful for a student than saying having just text. It allows students to practice. The best example of this is the Khan Academy for math with, which now has hundreds if not thousands of little short video clips on how to do algebra, how to do calculus etc. And uh, students can practice and practice using that. Explaining graphics, again voice over um, writing an equation for instance, uh, explaining what the parts of the equation mean. Um, interviews, bringing people in from outside the course um, if they're visiting for instance and in particular from moving from the concrete to the abstract and back again which many students particularly in colleges find very difficult working at an abstract level so video and audio allows you to give them concrete examples and then draw from the concrete examples the abstract principles that you're trying to teach them e-portfolios where students are assessed by the collection of work they they put together uh, in in the form of an e-portfolio of work and again I've drawn this example from UBC in the Faculty of Education students are now required by the College of Teachers to keep a, an e-portfolio of their teaching practice where they, they sometimes take video or photographs of their, of their class and what they're doing and then they reflect on what they've done in the e-portfolio and I think this, this is a very significant shift in terms of assessment because suddenly instead of giving them written um, pencil and paper uh, questions, you're actually asking students to demonstrate what they've learned um, in a multimedia format. And I have to ask myself, if I was an employer, what would I rather get? Uh, a transcript that says they got a B in, in my subject, in a particular subject area, or something that I can actually go in and see what they did in that program. And I know what will be more powerful for me as an employer. And lastly, and probably most significantly, is open educational resources. Now, unfortunately, there's a sort of, I don't know, um, a cult or a sort of group around open education resources that's saying must be done this way and I'm thinking particularly of MIT that's put all its lectures on video and you can download the lectures and so on. I, I think that's, they, that's missing the point. The internet is basically a whole set of open education resources. Um, you don't have to have it with a stamp from MIT on it. There's a whole pile of stuff out there. The example I've got is from the, the Open University's Open Learn. Open University has been teaching at a distance and online now for a long time and is very good at it. And this resource material is excellent because it's very interactive. It's designed for students who are learning at a distance. Whereas MIT stuff, it's a 50 minute boring lecture in most cases. And this is not the best way, I think, for many students to learn. Now there's a huge amount out there. Um, so I reckon that in in five to ten years time all content will be open. What does it mean for a curriculum when students can go anywhere and find information on the topic that they're supposed to be learning? So the, the, the question then is how do students and how do you as instructors evaluate what's out there? How do you get them to go and find information? What this technology does, I hate to tell you, there's a real secret behind it. You're moving the work from yourself to the students. You can get the students to do the work now. You provide the guidance and the facilitation, but they go out and find the content that they need on the internet. And lastly, virtual worlds. Um, I thought virtual worlds were dead until I came across this example. Um, Loyalist College in Ontario has created a virtual border post for training Canadian um, border officers. And so, you, and they, they, they role play. So sometimes they'll play the role of the drug smuggler who's trying to get the drugs through the border, and other times they play the role of the, the border officer who's trying to catch them. Um, and so, again, an, a very interesting way of developing problem-solving skills, um, getting students to apply what they've learned to situations that occur on the fly that they're not prepared for, and so on, but in a safe environment. So, what are the features of these new Web 2.0's tools? Well, first of all, 
the end user can control and author and create content and I think that's really important if we want active engaged learning then this is a these are great tools for getting students to do stuff Collaboration and sharing, a lot of it's about working together and uh, not just with students in the course, but for instance in the Latin American studies there were students from other Latin American universities also talking to student to student in a sense rather than faculty to faculty. Um, collective intelligence, obviously if you're teaching a course in Latin American studies and you've got not only your expertise as an instructor but all the other people who are contributing to the course as well as the students then probably you're getting to know a lot more as a student and probably more as a faculty member as a result of that. A lot of this technology is low cost, it's free um, and it's easily adaptable to your purposes. It's rich media, it's not just text, it's uh, video, audio, graphics um, and text and it's often portable and mobile. Increasingly all learning will be mobile. That doesn't mean to say you just take what you've got for a desktop learning and move it onto a mobile phone. You have to adapt it to the affordances of mobile learning and actually make use of it. Get students to use their mobile equipment to collect data, for instance, and bring it back into class. So those are some of the features of these Web 2.0 tools and the implications for education I think are very, very significant. First of all, learners have powerful tools. So that they've got tools now that they can use which are going to be just as powerful as any tools that you've got as an instructor. I think what we'll see more and more of is what I will call personal learning environments where the students are really saying well this is what I'm really interested in studying and I'll, I'll, I'll pick and choose and move myself around and I'll have these tools that I like and I won't use those tools because I don't like them but so long as I can get to the learning objectives then I, I'll fit the environment to my own needs. And it also allows for greater individualization of the teaching because, for instance, if you've got a group of students, maybe having students in a group, but the different groups are looking for different things, uh, but you're applying the things that you, you're, you're teaching them to their own unique uh, areas of interests and concerns and so on. So I think these tools allow for greater individualization of learning. I see more open access to content and services um, and particularly a key 21st century skills using these tools to enable learners to find, create, evaluate, add and adapt content um, because that's what they're going to be doing when they leave college. They're still going to be going on learning, they're still going to need to know where to find information and how to apply it and so on. And of course this is a power shift. Now this is, comes back to one of the psychological threats of all this. It's a power shift from instructors to learners. So let's look at how that works out in practice. I talk about e-learning 1.0 before Web 2.0 tools came along. Based on the use of a learning management system, uh, I've actually put up one of my own courses to show that I was doing e-learning 1.0 and I haven't moved very much from that model, which worked very well. I have to say that it has worked very well up to for the last 15 years. <laughs> um, I know, 15 years is pretty good for, for something to work. Uh, in that model, the instructor determines the content, the assessment is by the instructor, the learning environment is managed by the instructor, and if Web 2.0 tools come along, you just add them in, but you're still working within that learning management structure. E-learning 2.0 is the learning, and this is an extreme, I'm not saying it has to be like that, but this is an extreme. Learning is managed by the learner, uh, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration between learners, access to open content, learning is demonstrated by creating multimedia materials, and it's focusing on development of 21st century skills. So where does that leave the role of the instructor in, in learning? If we went, wanted to move to that model, what would your job be? Well, I think there are three potential roles. Uh, Stephen Downs and George Siemens, both Canadian commentators on uh, new technologies in education, both believe that there's no role for the instructor, that students will now be totally autonomous and self-directed and will learn what they want to learn and they don't need an instructor anymore. Minister of Education. <laughs> yeah. 
Or, and this is the, my, my version, the one that I support, the instructor is the guide on the side who helps learners, facilitates, guides, interacts with them, helps them organize, um, but leaves a lot of choice to the learner. Um, within a framework that you're creating. You set the standards, you set the assessment, um, you set the learning outcomes. Even those might be somewhat negotiable, but th within that the learner has a lot of choice about what route they take to get to those outcomes and goals. And the last one is teacher fully in control with Web 2.0 just extra tools for developing competencies within a very instructor controlled environment. So there, there are some choices here. So when would you use Web 2.0? Well, I, I think if you see learning as development. If you see a learner growing in their ability to learn. Um, a move from being an e a dependent learner where they need to be told what to learn and what the outcomes will be and how to get there to becoming then more independent as a learner, being able to manage their own learning, to eventually becoming an interdependent learner. In other words, not only do they learn, control their own learning, but they learn from other people as well and they feel comfortable about that. So the choice of Web 2.0 tools will depend on, on a number of things. First of all, the needs of the learner. Where are they? Many students aren't independent. They're not self-autonomous. So you may have to start with a more controlled environment, but then deliberately plan to move them to more independent learners. The requirements of accreditation. Um, if the accreditation agencies don't like the kinds of things that I'm suggesting, then that's too bad. You can't, you can't do it. I mean, we have to educate the accreditation agencies maybe, but you, you have to fit the needs of accreditation. And lastly, your educational philosophy. What, what, what do you believe is the best way to teach and how students should learn? And I'll come back to that in, in a moment. However, in my view, Web 2.0 are excellent tools for learner-centered teaching and develop, developing 21st century skills. And I, I do I've done a little chart. I, I try to. Th this is my personal. This reflects my view. Um, at one end we have teacher control, and the other end we have learner control. And then we have what I might call, uh, or what Gary probably more likely call, objectivist teaching, uh, where you think there's a, learnt, a body of knowledge to be learnt, and my job is to get that body of knowledge into the heads of the students. And then there's a more constructivist approach where you, students have to construct meaning and so on. And so the, the blue is the Web 2.0 tools, and you can see, like any tool, where they fit on there will depend on how you use the tools. But I, you know, so that's my personal concept map. And I think it would be helpful if you started developing your own personal concept map about where you feel these tools fit and how you want to use them. So that raises the question then, what kind, of courses sh sh what kind of course should I be teaching? And I think this is the fundamental question now that technology is throwing up. And I, I see it, online learning as a continuum. At one end you have face-to-face -face teaching with no technology, which is very rare. Then you have this kind of stuff, a PowerPoint slide, lecture in front of the class, using technology as a classroom aid. And then you have what I call hybrid learning, not blended learning, but hybrid, where you reduce the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. teaching time, but don't eliminate it, and you allow more time for students to study online. So it's not a distance course, but it's a course with a reduced face-to-face -face component. So the question then becomes, what should I do face-to-face, -face, and what should I do online? And then lastly, you have fully online or distance learning um, version. So you see it's a continuum, from no e-learning to full e-learning. And then I think blended learning is confusing because I never know what people are talking about, whether they're talking about classroom aids or whether they are actually redesigning the teaching um, in another way. And then you have distributed learning. So how do you decide on what kind of course? Well, first of all, there are four deciding factors. Your teaching philosophy, what kind of students you're trying to reach, or what kind of students you've been teaching but you may be feeling there are other students like the, the, the lady who wanted to learn from, from South Africa that you're not reaching. Um, the demands of the subject discipline um, and resources and I'll go through each of those quickly. First of all, how do you want to teach? Do you want to go from this 
to maybe a hybrid model like that. So the students are doing some things online, maybe in a group, and the rest in small